So this is Mark Graham. I'm at the South by Southwest conference. It's um, Saturday, and we're at uh, the Drones for Good session. Hi, everyone. I think we're going to get started. We're still filtering in, but um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming on Pi Day. I'm sure you all had a lot of things that you were competing for your attention. Um, we had considered actually calling this panel Outlaw Humanitarianism. Now that South by Southwest has uh, banned drones from the festival, but uh, you know, I thought that might maybe give the wrong signal. Uh, but Drones for Good uh, is going to uh, discuss uh, the application of drone technology, unmanned aerial vehicles, to humanitarian assistance, uh, relief, development, um, and conservation work uh, in a variety of different contexts. Uh, and um, we are going to try to keep this as interactive as possible. So as we go um, across, we're going to keep our remarks uh, quite brief um, and focus on discussion and invite dialogue, uh, as much dialogue as possible with uh, all of you. Uh, my name is Andrew Schroeder. I'm the Research and Analysis Director for Direct Relief. Um, Direct Relief is a non-governmental organization uh, we deliver essential medicines to local healthcare programs around the world, and I re uh, reasonably get a lot of questions from folks when I do uh, talks like this as to what in the hell I'm talking about drones for. Uh, what did drones have to do with medical relief? Um, and it's a it's a fair question. Um, we, we we found I think the scales fell from my eyes back in Typhoon Haiyan um, that drones have. Uh, the potential to change what we take for granted as the knowable in humanitarian response. Um, they have allowed for access um, visually to a field of um, distru and disrupted infrastructure, um, in our case medical infrastructure, um, and transportation logistics infrastructure that um, often we had not necessarily had um, access to uh, real-time feedback on. Um, and since then, in the year plus since Typhoon Haiyan, there's been a tremendous amount of activity that's gone on in this field around the world. And you're looking at several of the leading figures um, in this field um, that have uh, really pioneered a number of applications um, around uh, 
cartography, uh, situational awareness, increasingly the possibility for delivery of essential uh, relief supplies by small UAVs, um, and have altered the policy discussion around how we can uh, write community standards and rules uh, that can govern um, you know, the application of this in, in future uh, relief and development activities. Um, so uh, the order that we're going to go in is to start with uh, Patrick Meyer um, and then go down the, down the row and, and everyone will uh, just introduce themselves as we go along. Awesome. Thanks so much, and, and really big thanks to Andrew and Kate for actually bringing us together on this panel, and for all of you for joining us. So my name is Patrick, and I'm the author of a, a new book called Digital Humanitarian, which is a book on technologies for good, including drones for good, which is our topic today. I want to begin with saying that ceci n'est pas une pipe, um, and in many ways, ceci n'est pas un drone either because I think it's fair to say that most people, when they hear the word drone, are thinking immediately about killer robots. But that's not what we're talking about today, and that's not what's pictured here. This is a drone, it's a quadcopter, that was built by a local community in Ghana just last week. And it's made from recycled parts, um, spare parts, and you can see a lot of uh, rubber bands holding it all together, and it actually, it actually flies. So from, from Ghana to Guyana and all around the world, we're seeing more and more local communities build, building their own drones for good. In the case of Guyana, you have these beautiful forests, unfortunately under threat from illegal deforestation. So a local indigenous community has built its own drones with a little help from digital democracy. This is the first indigenous community that we know of that's built their own drones in order to document the crimes that are happening with the deforestation and the illegal demining and so on. And it really was a community-centered effort. And one of my favorite stories about this effort that took place a few months ago was at one point when the mount for the motor broke, the Wapichana, the indigenous communities called Wapichana, scoured their village in search for different types of plastic in order to fix the drone. And they eventually came across a crate of beer they snapped off a piece and they used that to fashion a new mount and it worked beautifully. And the reason I love sharing this anecdote is it's because it's at that point in time then that this technology, which perhaps was at once a uh, point mysterious, external, strange, becomes hackable. It becomes, it beca they take ownership of that technology and they turn it into something that they own and then can use. As a result of their first flights, just outside the forests, they were able to put together this 3D you know, flying through model of, of the area. Uh, again, the first of its kind, as far as we know, with respect to indigenous communities. Let's go to Haiti now, where a local team of Haitians in Port-au-Prince have been using UAVs for a few years now for disaster preparedness and disaster response. In fact, those Haitians are the ones who basically provide the international humanitarian community with the very high resolution aerial imagery that it needs for disaster risk reduction and uh, disaster relief operations as well. And these pilots, these pilots come from an area called the Red Zone, so designated by the United Nations because it's too dangerous, supposedly, to go into the Red Zone, which is a cité soleil, a sort of informal settlement slash slum, quote unquote. And this, in, in the Red Zone, is where the best pilots of the Caribbean uh, come from. They're some of the most passionate, committed people that I've met. Another very different situation is Syria, obviously still under siege, and the loyalists, the Bashir loyalists on behalf of the Assad government and so on, have been waging, continue to wage, a campaign of surrender or starve. And they've been unfortunately quite effective at that, cutting out, cutting food supply lines and and medical supply lines and so on. In fact, if you're caught smuggling uh, medical equipment, medication, water, food, you, you, you can often pay the price with, with your life. It's a huge problem. Now, low-cost UAVs um, have somewhat limited range and flight time. That's changing every month. Right? It's getting better and better. Um, but the fact is, a number of these towns in Syria that are under siege and are under a blockade are within a few miles dozen miles of the Turkish-Syrian border. In 
in fact, the town that you see here, that you can read in the city of uh, Kobani, which was attacked by ISIS and then uh, supplied uh, with airdrops by the US Air Force, is only one mile from the border. You can literally see that town that's being blockaded. So colleagues of mine have started an initiative called the Syria Airlift Project. They're working directly with Syrian refugees in California. In fact, in a couple of weeks, they'll be doing a whole set of simulations and demos. They're working directly with these refugees because at the end of the day, they're taking a very community-centered approach. The refugees themselves are learning how to build the drones and operate them for the distribution of small payloads. And we're not just talking about one drone. In fact, the approach that Syria Airlift is taking is a swarming approach. They're talking about dozens and dozens and dozens of drones, and they're optimizing this to basically be able to deliver up between 200 to 300 kilos worth of much needed aid within a day. Because it's not just one flight a day. The best thing, best way to think about this is, a, is an aerial conveyor belt. These are robots, they don't get tired. They just get recharged, they go back, and they fly. And again, it's a fully community-centered approach. Let's go to Kenya, where a local community, and again, in the Tana River Delta, have been working with an awesome team called the Sentinel Project not only to actually use drones for disaster response, there are huge issues around flash floods in the <coughs> part of Kenya, but their primary use case for the use of drones is the prevention of violence. You see, in that corner of Kenya and others as well, it's certainly not unique, rumors can spread very quickly and can actually lead to violence <coughs> and people getting hurt or worse still, actually people getting killed because of rumors. So they're with the local communities using these drones, both fixed wings and, and quadcopters, to very rapidly verify rumors, unconfirmed reports, in order to prevent that those, those rumors from basically getting out of control and leading to violence. So, so conflict prevention is exactly what's happening. A year ago, I launched uh, with some great uh, colleagues and friends uh, on this panel, the humanitarian UAV network, which in a way you can think of as the match.com for drones for good, in the sense that we have access to over 900 drone pilots in more than 70 different countries around the world, a figure that increases every week. And what we do is we basically match these pilots to humanitarian organizations all around the world, large and small, uh, for uh, supporting a wide variety of, of humanitarian efforts. And I can say that within the past 48 hours, to give you an example, the World Bank approached the humanitarian UAV network in the context of the uh, high-end uh, Category 5 cyclone, Cyclone Pan, that's just uh, devastated the Vanatu, the Pacific regions. And within literally minutes, we were able to identify a handful of UAV pilots in Australia who were ready to go. And so now they're being mobilized or standby, and if we hope to get a few of them into Vanatu next week as long as the airport is uh, reopened. So it's, it's really, really happening. And, um, so not only local communities are using these technologies for self-help in a variety of contexts, but humanitarian organizations, established humanitarian organizations. You may recognize this uh, quadcopter, it's pretty famous, the DJI Phantom or Phantom 2. Over one million units uh, have been sold over the years. And, and obviously, <coughs> those are not going to humanitarian organizations for the most part, it's going to members of the public, right? Enthusiasts and so on, so increasingly, the aerial perspective is becoming democratized, which is precisely why we launched this crowdsourced crisis map of aerial videos and photos of disaster zones from all around the world, is to basically have the, the crowd be the eyes and ears from a bird's eye view perspective. This, however, is going to lead inevitably to a big data challenge. Uh, FEMA is saying this, European humanitarian organizations are saying this. So we've been partnering with the United Nations, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, and Developing a prototype, an experimental prototype called Micromappers. It's again free and open source. And what Micromappers does is it combines crowdsourcing with artificial intelligence, with, with machine learning, basically, to uh, filter through this vast amount of big data quote unquote that gets generated. I'll give you an example of how we use this with aerial imagery and give you a lot of the use case in this kind in environmental and wildlife conservation. Uh, with a team of rangers in Namibia, who were basically sitting on 25,000 aerial images after having collaborated with some friends of mine at Drone Adventures. And the reason they wanted this aerial imagery of their wildlife reserves is because they want to do better wildlife protection and wildlife monitoring. It was a huge uh, rhino poaching uh, situation in Namibia, which is also true across Southern Africa. So they spent a couple of weeks flying these EVs, and you can see one 
here landing. This was in Turkey last fall for an archaeology project. These flying robots are really flying robots. This is automated landing on its own, automated flight path, uh, flight plans, and so on. Completely, you know, no human interaction. So the, there you go. You have two rangers in Namibia sitting on 25,000 aerial images, and is that really the best use of their time? They shouldn't be behind a computer or a laptop. They should be out in the bush, actually saving, protecting the animals. So they very kindly agreed to share their aerial imagery with us. We posted it on Micro Mathers and we invited the crowd, that hundreds of about six, seven hundred volunteers from all around the world, to search for Namibia's wildlife. And they looked through all these images in less than 24 hours. That's really important to know because the rangers told us themselves they would have taken them months to go through this. In less than 24 hours, they were able to find all the uh, animals that were to be found in these images. And so we obviously shared the results with our very happy ranger partners in Namibia, but we also shared the results with our partners, our trusted partners at the EPFL, a technical university in Lausanne, Switzerland. And they basically used that data to create, as far as we know, the first ever automatic algorithm to detect gazelles. Um, we haven't published this yet, but we're very proud to announce publicly here that we can now automatically detect gazelles. So, a great proof of concept. And um, so I'll finish with this. Is this a drone? I don't know, you know what, what do you think? What, what I do know is that these technologies are having very real, uh, positive social good impact around the world. It's not hype, and I hope these examples really show you uh, that this is the case. So a lot more on all of this on, in my book, Digital Dash Humanitarian Stuff. Thanks. The book is, is great, by the way. You should, you should pick it up and, and, uh, and read it cover to cover. It's a terrific book. Um, and the, the big data challenge portion of this is a great segue for Kate uh, Chapman from Humanitarian Open Street Map. Uh, Hi, I'm Kate Chapman. As Andrew said, I'm the executive director of the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, or we call ourselves POT for short. Uh, we apply the principles of open source and open geographic data to both humanitarian response and economic development. Uh, we do this in two ways. We coordinate remote digital volunteers to uh, interpret information such as satellite information to create base map data. We also work with local communities to help them learn to map themselves to better prepare in case a disaster does happen. One of the big issues for us is to have imagery for people to look at in similar ways to Patrick's um, example of wildlife. Uh, you have to have that imagery. Uh, and there's many, many satellites um, out there that do image the earth, but a lot of times that data is not freely available. Uh, you have, it can be very difficult to obtain or very expensive. Uh, but with UAVs or drones, uh, that starts to allow people to actually be able to take these pictures at a very low cost. Uh, and what we've begun to see more and more is when a disaster happens, people say, hey, we're going, we're flying drones. Uh, we're gonna go take pictures. Uh, and my first question is, are you going to have open data? Are people actually going to use the information you collect to actually affect humanitarian response? Uh, the first time we actually successfully said, got from someone who said they were flying UAVs, got imagery, was Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, which Andrew also referred to. Um, a group had gone and taken pictures of Tacloban, one of the heaviest hit cities, and we were in fact actually able to get that imagery and make it openly available. Um, one of the problems is there's not really a platform for this. Uh, the idea of open aerial map has been around since about 2006, when people first began taking pictures with UAVs and began to think, what are we gonna do with this? Can I share it? Uh, and so what we're building is an open distributed repository for freely available imagery. Uh, so you can go search and see what's available and also <coughs> then use that. Um, and what's important around this is that it's open, but also people have access. Since there's many places, um, imagery is a big is a big data problem. We're just downloading it is not going to be an option. So by having a distributed system, it'll be possible to work offline, go fly your imagery, and then process it and use it locally. And then when you do have connections, a connection to be able to upload that to the main system. And this is something we're very actively working on. Um, 
But for me, and Patrick talked about it a lot, that local access is really important. Um, so often we go and take data from people. Uh, we Groups go in and they do surveys, and then the people who answered those surveys, for example, never see the results of it. Did, um, did the food that was dropped, did it come from the fact that they answered that survey, or did it just people decide to do a food distribution? Um, and so with map data for us, allowing people to actually use that data um, is, is important. We don't just take. And I think that's um, really key with some of these drone projects as well, is to have that open and local community access. Um, and we're certainly interested, as I mentioned, we do a lot of um, international volunteers doing mapping, um, but we also do the local aspect. Um, and some of the questions we're trying to answer um, with imagery is, we digitize um, the imagery to create, for example, a roadmap. So if you're doing a vaccine distribution and you need to get from point A to point B, and you can only keep the vaccines in cold storage for 12 hours, if you arrive in 14 hours because you took a wrong turn, then you've wasted a lot of money and potentially affected lives. Um, and so that's the second step. We're interested in the open data, but then the processing and what you can do with it to actually make effective decisions. Thanks, Kate. Um, and we're, we have very fortunate to be joined by Chris Fabian, who had made it all the way here on a manned aircraft from Pakistan. Um, and uh, uh, Chris is from UNICEF, uh, Innovations Labs. <coughs> so my brain's super mushy right now. Um, so I'm trying to categorize what I would say to three different areas. First, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there are going to be like number, numbers of things. So I'm going to give you nine principles that are important when we're thinking about drones. Um, five areas of need right now, and one joke in there somewhere. Um, there, see, that was my joke. Done. <laughs> um, but I wanted to start just because I think I want to, uh, and, and we were talking about this a little bit before the panel, jump ahead to answer a question which we believe is certainly going to be asked, and so we're just going to try to get it out of the way, which is about the nomenclature and, and the kind of concept and name of drone, and you know, what, is this a UAV, a UAS, is it too scary to call it a drone, and whether or not we've sort of reached a tipping point where we can just get on with this work. Um, when I was in Pakistan last week, I was talking to a bunch of friends there, Pakistani friends of mine, who, uh, and, and I was saying, like, oh, are we in South Pakistan? I was talking about something that I can't mention in public here. Uh -huh. like, what is it? I can't talk about it. It's about things like this. Like, oh, oh, oh. Well, Chris, are you talking about drones? Like, yeah. So it's not, you know, they're like drones are, you know, the big problem here at this wedding that we were at in Karachi was that drones were flying around everywhere. I'm like, yes, I know. Like, no, no, no. Drones are flying around to take photos of the wedding. For people and the drones are kind of like interfering with each other and making a lot of noise and it's you know, that's like the big problem for us right now. And I was thinking that the concept of a drone and its commercial use right now is an ability to be used as a wedding photographer um, in Karachi and that being something that's actually at the tip of people's tongues rather than as the killer robot is really interesting. And we've worked very hard at UNICEF's Innovation Unit over the last year and a half to see if we need to rebrand this thing. So we did a whole exercise to come up with a logo and a new acronym which is a dove driverless operated vehicle environment, and I think that was a waste of our time. Um, I think we can just go ahead and call it a drone. And the, the reason that, that it's seen, I mean, it seems to be at a tipping point in the way that other technology has been in the past decade that we've seen um, really create huge impacts on people, on the lives of children, and particularly the lives of the most marginalized children. Our team at UNICEF looks at identifying and scaling the type of exponential technology um, that maybe doesn't seem kind of at hand in the world's most difficult operating environments. And in 2007 and 2008, we were looking at mobile phones and <coughs> SMS, like the text message, as a delivery mechanism for information. And at that point, I remember having people say, this is a, there's no way that this technology is going to get into you know, rural Western Tanzania or wherever, wherever. And it was so apparent when you go to a place like the ones where you saw pictures from Patrick's uh, slides that this technology is already there. As soon as beer is being used in innovation, you know that there's like that there's something right in your, your case. Um, and and I think that drones are there too, whether or not we uh, we call them a drone or a flying vehicle or whatever. So the and, and I think it's kind of at hand the way other technology that has been militarized and has come into practical public use with its GPS or rocket ships or, or whatever um, the internet has, has taken hold. But I really want to talk about these two numbered areas, the nine principles on, about uh, looking at technology development and then the five needs right now. One of the things that our team has seen when we've 
failed, and we have about a 100% failure rate when building things in New York, which is why we had 12 labs in the world where we build things and only maybe have a 95% failure rate, is that if we follow a basic set of principles for trying out new technology in these unknown spaces, when we fail, which we will, we at least fail less stupidly than we would have otherwise. Um, and these principles have been built in collaboration with partners like USAID, um, 12 other UN agencies, major funders like Gates, CETA, uh, Swedish Development Agency. And these principles are things that are so simple in 2015. They're things like be open source when you build technology that's going to affect the bottom quintile, the bottom billion, the next set of consumers. Um, like build things locally for exactly that reasons that Patrick mentioned. Make sure that the, the building of stuff does not happen in universities in the US for northeastern Zambia. <coughs> Make sure that when you're building stuff, it's sustainable so that when the motor does break, some part in the village can be used to be repurposed and make a new motor bit. And all of those principles, you can find them if you Google like principles of innovation, UNICEF, USA, or whatever, something like that, you'll find them. All of those principles need to be applied to the space of unmanned vehicles and drones. Um, and I think they need to be particularly applied here because it's at, we're at a point where the market pressures in the private sector are going to increase in the next year or two as these technologies become more commercially viable. And if we're looking at working in the most difficult parts of the world, where we need to work with local populations, we need to be sure that we can be a, uh, a barrier in a good way to private sector that may push out the market focus on that bottom set of consumers. Um, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit more in questions. But there are five big needs that we've identified in the space of drones and drones for humanitarian work uh, that I think we can use the next 18 months to really flesh out. One is around the hardware types what type of hardware is being used, how it's being used. We have one of our labs working on open source printed 3D hardware, that's the one in Zambia, um, for drones, and looking at, at exactly what the sort of variety of the hardware are. The second one is on the software that's being used. The third is the use cases. Um, we've, the, the one that comes to mind and is most tangible and, and everybody talks about is delivery, delivery of things, delivery of supplies. That's the one that seems the furthest out to us, as opposed to providing communications networks and providing imagery. Um, the fourth one is the regulatory environment. And I've had many discussions with people who represent the equivalent of the FAA in their countries about how we can regulate the testing and prototyping of drones. And not the commercial use or the nonprofit use, but the actual early stage prototyping. And there's a huge space for discussion around that. Um, and the last one is the communication around uh, these vehicles and what they can do. I think that the, the big ask that I would put forward to everybody in this room and maybe hopefully open up a little bit of questions and answers is how we can ensure that over the next year, as this technology increases exponentially in its ability to deliver stuff and decreases exponentially in its cost per unit, whatever that unit is, kilograms of, of weight that it can carry or amount of time that it can fly, that we can create and ensure an open market um, for these devices. <coughs> ensure that the technologies that are created at the end of the day serve the populations that they can help most, which are probably not those of us who want to have an Amazon book delivered to our door like five hours faster. Uh, but those of us who are in situations dramatically affected by either natural disasters, conflict, uh, or other difficulties. Thank you. So, so that, I think that was a great um, agenda setting uh, conversation so far uh, from looking at uh, uh, the cartographic implications of uh, drones or dubs now as we're uh, they call them, uh, looking at uh, the communities themselves that are beginning to uh, take up this technology um, and determine uh, application pathways that uh, all of us did not necessarily think of, to the big data challenge, uh, to the regulatory environment. And I'm wondering if I can start off the conversation by asking folks on the panel here to speculate a little bit uh, about where uh, the, you see the future of this going. So um, if we're at a moment right now where uh, we have early stage applications that are uh, starting to uh, percolate around all of these various areas, um, and we have a potentially exponential uh, growth curve coming for uh, some of the um, components of the system to support this, where do you see this coming in, in 18 months? Okay, Patrick, Punks. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go back to Patrick's example from Syria and say that it's about very, very small modular swarms of things doing stuff together. Um, that I think that that's where the, the, the big leap forward is gonna be, whether it's 
having lots of small things doing mapping. Maybe the delivery conveyor belt is going to be really robust in 18 months. But, uh, but the, where we see the future of this and the kind of types of investments that I think I'm most interested in making are in um, small, very inexpensive, and, and modular types of drones that can work together to do complex tasks. Because we know that the fail rate for one piece, if you put you know, $5,000 or $1,000 into a single piece, um, its fail rate and its fail expectation is way too high. And so we need to get to a level of simplicity um, and multiplicity that can allow us to kind of meet our objectives even when one or two or three of the points of the system fail. So my focus is on open source. Uh, there's a lot of advancements in being able to build completely open source systems, but they're not end to end, um, especially if you look at the processing of the imagery. Um, there's very good commercial systems where you can together, get your drone out of the box, um, fly it, collect imagery, have all that data automatically processed for you. But if you don't have ten or twenty thousand um, dollars, that's not possible. And we do a lot of training with local communities, and if you train someone to do something, they should have access to be able to do that in the future. And that's why, where open source comes in. If I teach someone software or teach someone how to fly a drone, it should be possible for them to do it again without me. And I think there'll be improvements in that chain so that's easier to do, there's less setup time, and better access. I really can't talk that. I, that's my whole thing to add. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things I'd like to pick up on is the concept of movement of physical goods being far out there. Um, the, uh, there are some early stage examples. Um, you know, I, we, I talked a couple weeks ago to um, Andreas Rathopoulos, the CEO of Matternet, about uh, experiments that are starting to take place. Uh, they've done a work in Bhutan, they've done work uh, in Papua New Guinea where they've started to use small UAVs to move small amounts of goods. You called it an uh, aerial conveyor belt. And, the, one of the things to, to bear in mind about that is that it, it may actually be changing the assumption about what a logistics network is in humanitarian response. So our assumption is from years of experience has been that a humanitarian logistics network involves large scale airplanes and trucks. Um, uh, it involves uh, maybe motorcycles that are getting out into uh, harder to reach areas. Um, it involves being stopped routinely when we have heavy rainfall that uh, blocks roads. <coughs> but what if you took those assumptions away? Um, what if you no longer had to assume that uh, that is what a logistics network looks like? Um, how would we think about um, how humanitarian assistance ought to be funded, how, ought to, how it ought to be set up, how um, we ought to um, sort of move ahead with, with planning out um, uh, the efficiency of humanitarian response? Um, Deb, you said, so when you think about this as sort of far out, um, you started to see assumptions changing at all. So I think that when we're looking at uh, delivery of, of material after a natural disaster or humanitarian um, event, we, you know, you tend to, there, there are a few types of things that you need to deliver. Let's just look at any difficult operating environment. Let me take Zambia right now, which is not suffering from a, a typhoon, but is suffering from the fact that it takes us 30 days to get a paper sample of a dried blood spot of infant's blood from northeast Zambia to Lusaka, and that's about maybe 200 kilometers. It takes us 30 days to get that paper sample there, get it tested, and then another 30 days to get the answer back when this baby's life is basically dependent on whether or not we know the results of the sample. That's 60 day turnaround time to go mm, less than 400 kilometers total return. That's insane in 2015. And that's just a piece of paper. Uh, when we're talking about delivery of emergency supplies and we're trying to figure out how to deliver water uh, materials to, to, to make sure that there's clean water or vital health supplies, that's obviously something that has a lot more volume and mass than a piece of paper. So I think that when we're looking at what the capacity is for a drone to lift, there's some basic assumptions about the fact that we need to get into a country certain types of things, certain volume of supply, and that can only come uh, from immediate airlifts. And this is talking about the thousands and tens of thousands of metric tons of material that needs to arrive to a country. And so that needs to be based somewhere. And from there, the ability to spread it out. 
And there are certain points in that supply chain where you can lift small things and create efficiencies. And there are certain points where I actually think like Zeppelins would be a really, really good way of getting lots and lots of heavy material from one country to another in a sudden onset disaster. So I think it's really about looking at where the function is and where the necessity is to move small amounts of stuff quickly over dispersed areas and where you need to be kind of thinking about packaging and moving stuff in clumps. And I think looking at the way that um, DHL optimized their supply chain is really instructive to us in terms of thinking about where it is that you need long trucks to move big things and where you can have small trucks that join those long trucks and kind of like ants distribute the little pieces like breadcrumbs. Um, but it needs that type of mapping and it can't be done on emotion. It can't be done because we think this is a new technology and we fetishize it and we're like, ooh, if we could only fly this little thing from here to there. I mean, you have to think about the numbers and figure out how many small things you need to get in order to deliver one big thing in small pieces to make it a big thing again. And that takes quantification, it takes math, it takes people who are good at logistics. And that's a very different exercise from um, sort of saying, hey, just because it's a new technology, we think it's good. So I think that there's a, a time that we should spend uh, very thoughtfully thinking about it from the same economical sort of point of view that a, that a shipping and transport company or network would think about its distribution. I'd like to invite folks from the audience who, uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to use the mic in the middle of the room. Um, I also just one really quick thing that occurred to me that I'm from that I was supposed to ask you to remember to rate this session, so just keep that in your mind. Um, the, uh, but if anyone has questions, please feel free to come to the middle of the room. Um, uh, in the meantime, one of the things I've also wanted to pick up on is the, um, you know, the, we talked about a lot of different components of these uh, systems uh, and of the imperative to open source these components. That's from the data to the uh, control systems to uh, the uh, vehicles themselves. And I've, I've where do you sort of see, if we were to think about this from an investment point of view, where is the sort of greatest need to make some of these more humanitarian applications uh, real? Where, where is the sort of greatest need for um, being able to increase development of some of the components of the system as a whole? Good question. I'm going to say the hardware and the control systems. I think those are the ones most lagging. Uh, there's also a lot of need just for automated imagery processing. There's a lot of things that we ask digital humanitarians to do these days where humans can do it, but we need, let's say, a thousand humans to do it. Whereas, could we get that down to one or two people processing it? And then we can take that thousand people and put them on another problem that people um, solve better than machines right now. Hi, I'm Melinda Jenkins. I'm a family nurse practitioner, and I really appreciate all of the examples you've given about the health uh, applications of this technology. Um, one thing that is in my mind, because I know of some work that's being done through uh, Department of Defense funding, is what about multi-sensory perception, such as auditory or other kinds of things besides visual? that the drones can use you know, for surveillance or um, feedback and, and what do you know about those kinds of things? I mean, on the, from the search and rescue side, I have heard colleagues say that, you know, if you're flying a, a, one of those UN helicopters over debris looking for people who are trapped under the rubble, you're not going to hear anybody screaming for help. I mean, it's just going to drown out anything by getting these huge choppers. I think this was done in the US, if I remember correctly. But what they did is they flew uh, quadcopters instead with like a very sensitive audio microphone um, to basically pick up any sort of human noises that could potentially be an indication that somebody is trapped in that area. That's the only use case that I've come across. But of course, you know, these are going to be flying multi sensor robots. And as the different sensors like LiDAR, Thermal imaging is already quite cheap, but as all these different multi sensors become cheaper and cheaper and more portable and, and miniature, then it's not about one sensor on, on, a, on, a, on a unit, but multiple sensors, just like in, in the case of um, satellites, right? The satellites are not carrying from <coughs> one place to the other. But I don't know, that's just how it comes to Um, 
sort of point that speaks to the exponential curve, actually, um, that, um, you know, the first generation of small unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, was, um, you know, required essentially being a skilled gamer in order to fly effectively um, at the cost of potentially crashing a multi-thousand dollar vehicle into a tree. Um, and that starts to get inhibiting in terms of the potential risk, uh, you know, either to your vehicle, and at best as a tree, it might be actually something, some other person. Um, this has become much um, easier to deal with over time as autopilot has become, open source autopilot has been uh, uh, installed in a, a very wide variety of vehicles. Um, mission planning software um, is free and widely available, uh, very easy to use, requires a, you know, a, a small uh, couple day learning curve. Uh, even I can do it. Uh, and, you know, you know, it, it's become uh, something that increasingly feels like a part of the humanitarian toolkit, uh, in our case, where, uh, you know, think back to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, 20 years ago, what uh, kinds of software was considered to be uh, challenging for many people to use, particularly in remote environments. I mean, uh, the development curve for UAVs has been very vast on this. Um, yeah. And I think, uh, to this point, Drones are going to get super boring to fly in like a minute. Oh. You know, it's not going to be this kind of flying around and like, you can see the thing. It's going to be setting waypoints, figuring out certain like conditions for the mission, <coughs> figuring out a back and forth, and then maybe some human comes in at some point to do some little thing. But most of it's going to be like sleeping. Right? There's, there's not going to be human interaction. So I think the question is again, I mean, how do we look at people who are ready to do complex logistics and supply exercises like the big shipping companies? where most of their job is also really boring. Like you don't need a person driving a truck across the country, really, or you do right now, but you won't in six years, 10 years, um, to do most of that. You need specific human checkpoints to come in and look at specific parts of that exercise. And I think that's about figuring out where in the system those interventions are needed and how you can make the other part of it, the mission planning, be as intuitive and flexible as possible. I mean, yeah, it's uh, definitely spot on. I think it's when technologies become boring, I think it was Clay Shirky who said that technologies <coughs> become boring is when they start having major, uh, major impact. Um, I, you know, I want to share with you just this 10 second footage from the uh, Wabichana in, in Guyana. I mean, it, it is also learning by doing, and uh, those of you who have maybe experimented with drones, you crash inevitably, and this was them doing the same thing that we do, right, but just um, learning by doing. So you see. Let's take a couple in a row. So aviation regulations. Um, yeah, I wanted to know if you comment on the 
future battle between it seems open source on the one hand, and then you have uh, EGAI on the other hand, which is operating more like commercial based solutions, but seems to offer map, the mapping, the ground control software, and the hardware all in one, versus the open source on the other side, which is a choose your own mapping software, choose your own uh, hardware. Where do you see that playing out? <coughs> source versus commercial. Uh, we have a question on your process at UNICEF for uh, beginning to uh, update this technology. Uh, do we want, and a couple others, do we want to, do we have a preference for where you want to start? They're very, very good questions. So uh, I mean, all of these are already spot on. There, there are many challenges, of course. I think on the regulation side, it's one thing we're trying to do, all of us <coughs> in this panel, with the humanitarian UAV network, is to engage regulators and policymakers and ICAO know, hey, you know, there's a difference between using drones for precision agriculture uh, and using drones to potentially save lives and, and relieve suffering. And we, in the humanitarian space, need to have perhaps uh, you know, our own set of regulations that apply to us. We have to weigh the risks of these technology, but we also have to weigh the benefits. It has to be a cost-benefit analysis, which the Europeans are very much they got it, they're very forward thinking. And so there are great examples of uh, regulators, civil aviation authorities that, that get it from the Australians, Canadians, French, and the British particularly, who uh, don't see it as an on off one drone. And you know, a lot of other less enlightened uh, aviation authorities basically equate a, a 100 kilo drone with a 600 gram drone. And they just say, no, absolutely not. And it's going to take a lot of patience uh, I think on, on our end, and to make sure that we don't turn the regulators as uh, the enemies or the opponents, but what they need from us is uh, more information and more uh, examples of what the possible guidelines and regulations are. And, it, and I have to say, it is for me the single biggest challenge to this space in the drones for good space. I give you two quick examples. Number one, uh, Typhoon Haiyan is mentioned a number of times because that was really that was the milestone. Number of different drones was really unprecedented. Uh, there were not really any regulators uh, regulations in the Philippines in 2013. You fast forward to Typhoon Ruby a few months ago, and between those two typhoons, regulations were implemented, and it took us <coughs> weeks and weeks and weeks to get permission from the government for our partners on the ground to fly their UAVs. These are experts uh, with qualifications and so on, and they weren't allowed to fly. And we have the same issue with the World Bank project in Tanzania. This is the World Bank. This is not a small little NGO that nobody's heard of. And even the World Bank is having a lot of difficulty uh, trying to uh, you know, demonstrate that this would have a lot of added value to be able to do flood management and so on. So regulations are an issue. Um, the good news is we're, we're doing our best to work on it as a community, and it's going to take a community approach. 
just one thing to quickly follow up on that uh, Patrick has really spearheaded in a, in a laudable way here. Um, if you go to uaviators.org, there's a code of conduct um, that has been developed uh, through the participation of a number of different uh, people uh, from various perspectives within the humanitarian UAV community um, as a way to get out in front of the conversation um, and to voluntarily establish a set of standards and practices for uh, people that um, are both uh, you know, flying drones, are using drone imagery, um, and are um, you know, working on uh, relationships with various uh, government entities around the world that are required in order to be able to carry this forward. So I think that's been a really important step to be able to get out in front of the conversation before that uh, sort of comes in and we're subjected to a variety of other perspectives. Uh, there were a couple of the questions I just wanted to make sure we don't drop some of the others. I'm happy to hop on the other okay. one. So first of all, on the uh, delivery of supplies to Syria, that one just make sure that the, the example that Patrick mentioned is has nothing to do with UNICEF or the UN's delivery of supplies. UNICEF is working very carefully to make sure that we're delivering supplies to children both inside and outside of Syria. It involves a set of relationships that we have with parties on the ground and outside, so, but that is, does not involve conveyor lines of drones or robots or anything else, so just to be clear on that differentiation. Um, it sounds very bureaucratic for me to say, but that's that line. Um, and the, I think that the question of the open source versus commercial is really important. Uh, I remember in 2006, 2007, there was one company which owned all of the health, mobile health data for a country in, let's just say Rwanda, for Rwanda. It was a private sector company in the US that owned the health data for Rwanda. When Rwanda stopped paying that company, the company wouldn't let the government of Rwanda have access to the data. And that's not fair. That's not okay. In, at all. I don't even know if it's really legal, but if it is legal, it shouldn't be. Um, we need to be very careful that we don't put ourselves in a place where proprietary interests own data that should belong to governments or to people themselves. And I think that the only way to do that is ensuring that there is an open source chain for production to use of data across this drone space, which also means that we need people to have the capacity to create their own hardware, even if that's not what they end up doing at the end of the day. Maybe they use some commercial solution, but there has to be an end to end flow through so that data sovereignty can exist, that people can have access to the data that they create, and that, that there's no commercial realization for that that keeps people from having that access. So I think that's hugely important. We know we've done we've done that kind of opening up. Uh, UNICEF purchases a third of the world's vaccines. About four years ago, we got together the heads of all the big pharma companies and said to them, we need you to open up your pricing data, which previously had been closed. <coughs> uh, because we're such a big purchaser, because we have that kind of market shaping capacity, we were able to open it up. And you can see that some of them were charging seven times as much for essential vaccines for children as others, uh, which changed immediately when those prices were open. And I think that's the type of market shaping that we need to be involved in. And in this space where there's clearly going to be a market for quickly, immediately, locally produced data, humanitarian data, development data, from these machines, we need to be able to shape the market. And that goes to the question from Gates, um, from the Gates Foundation. The Gates Foundation is a huge potential player in this space, as is USA and others. And I think we need to sit together and have that set of principles which we've all agreed upon, but have also a set of investment cases which say this is how we're using those. Our investments come from countries. We have countries like Malawi and Zambia saying to us that they need this technology. We have an investment fund, a venture fund set up at UNICEF that allows us to make small investments into those types of cases. And I think that that's the way to go. Rather than create a big pot of money at a global level and say this is gonna to go to a global project, look at seeding in a VC kind of approach. Seeding a set of projects which we think have a high portfolio's chance of success, but which we know individually might die out quite quickly, uh, gives us the ability to create that open space, create that open area with investment, and also gives us the ability to track what's winning and track what doesn't work so we can share those examples. Um, as well. That's it. That's what I wanted to cover. Um, I wanted to also touch on the open source a little bit. Um, is there going to be a point where drones are a commodity, but the services around them aren't? Um, and I think when you start looking at working in difficult environments and helping uh, communities develop ec economically, um, you don't want to be in a scenario where, like, a North American company is—they're um, the ones making the money. Should a local business be able to provide those services instead? And it's possible to do that through a wholly proprietary commercial method, but highly unlikely. Um, the, the story where, where the government couldn't have access to the data about their own people, that's happened so many times over the years. Um, it will probably, ha it'll certainly happen, happen again, but I think we have a moral responsibility to minimize that by having 
end-to-end uh, -end system that's open. Just to pick up on the same thing, though, that, and I think this goes back to something that Patrick was talking about earlier, that um, you know, uh, the reduced cost, a rapidly redu uh, falling cost for commercial drones uh, throughout many uh, areas of the world, particularly, say, urban areas uh, where uh, you, know, you have um, people buying these um, and then, say, be finding themselves in the middle of disaster, wanting to apply their own technology to response environments um, is, is going to be something that emerges organically and there will be a very uh, diverse array of different solutions that are all going to be posed. Um, how we incorporate um, the global crowd, for want of a better word, into this, people that will be flying their own uh, vehicles that will be producing by the industry, <coughs> Um, how, how do we incorporate that data? How do we make sure that they're not getting in, in each other's way? How do, we, how do we link them up with some kind of uh, both coordination system, um, the ability to, to get that imagery to where it needs to go, to the ability to coordinate with humanitarian organizations that may also be doing the same thing in a more structured way, um, is gonna be one of the great challenges of the next couple of years as we see this. Um, and it's not something that we're going, that there's a plan for, um, and it's not something, all arguably there can be a plan for. So, the, and I don't know that it is a, it's a kind of a false distinction in that sense between commercial versus open source technology. Um, you'll see both, and they'll both be incredibly valuable. I think I would, I would add, I think it's spot on, and I would add, I mean, that's, we already see this idea of aerial social media um, during disasters and in between disasters and so on, people posting their video footage, aerial video footage on YouTube or other pictures on Flickr, and that's one of the motivations behind that crowdsource crisis map that I, that I showed earlier. It's like, okay, let's, let's leverage that user <coughs> content um, if it's already, it's already there. And then with the humanitarian UAV network, what we do when there's a major disaster and there's a demand for the use of you know, aerial support is we have an operations page on the UAV user's website where we basically say, right, here's what you meant. You know, the World Bank is looking for support for Manatu. Uh, if you're available, uh, you know, please post um, your information, your qualifications, your background, the kind of technologies you have, and, and when you can mobilize. And so we're trying to do that in a very Web 1.0 kind of way right now, uh, just to at least have a space where people can, can coordinate. And we did that after Typhoon Ruby, and it was really the first time ever, and this was just a few months ago, where the UN was an active partner in this as well. So they were the ones who were basically coordinating the requests for the government permissions um, to, to fly for different groups and we used the UAV user's website, the operations page, when about half a dozen folks said, I'm in the Philippines, I can fly, I would like to get permission. It was, it was actually really well coordinated uh, with the UN. So with the professionals, uh, pilots and the DIY pilots, uh, you know, we have that growing community. And then for members of the crowd, we use that crowdsource crisis map. And I should say there's a bit of an ulterior motive behind that crowdsource map. What we do is we use that as a way to expose members of the public to the code of conduct that Andrew rightly mentioned. So we believe that, maybe optimistically, but that, that the members of the public can be part of the solution. And, and, and you know, education and raising awareness and letting people know the do's and don'ts uh, on the use of these technologies in humanitarian settings is, I think, our responsibility if we want to try as much as possible to avoid accidents and mistakes. So anyway, a very good point. Um, who wants to take up virtual reality? Who wants to? <laughs> the question on virtual reality. I would mean, just say that that's another technology that's also um, emerging and <coughs> something that we're tracking. We just uh, got <coughs> the production of our first immersive experience in, the, in a refugee camp in Jordan, in the Zatari camp. Um, which, if you look up clouds over Cedra, you can you can you can get the video. You can put it if you've got a, a VR headset. You can put it on and watch it. It's pretty incredible. Um, and we believe, as as our team, that that's another area of, of significant growth and change in the way we communicate about environments. Um, we haven't looked specifically at the meshing between that technology and, and drone stuff yet, but it's clear that like, as a package of things that are changing very quickly, they both sort of fall under that same that same umbrella. But again, I think just because like we're not looking too much at the driver side of, of drone stuff, that that one-to-one -one experience is probably for us, the, it's going to be less about any kind of operational thing and maybe more about an experiential product after the fact. 
one last thing I wanted to mention, um, just that uh, I've, I've uh, been recording this and we're gonna have this posted on the NetHope Solutions Center. Um, the NetHope is an organization that uh, Lee 